Hello, my name is David Mitchell, uh, and in this conversation about the human sciences, considered from the point of view of theory of knowledge, I'm joined by my colleague here at New College of the Humanities, Dr. Mariana Colley, who is a convener and senior lecturer in economics here. Mariana, of course, economics is one of the human sciences. Uh, what other disciplines would we include under that heading? Well, I think that's a big conversation in itself, and I think a lot of academics would have many different opinions on this. Certainly something like, politics, uh, like political science, international relations, psychology, I would class under human sciences, possibly human geography, sociology, anthropology. And there are other people who would put other things into that list as well. Right, yes. So the, that class of disciplines pretty much matches the list one might give if asked what the social sciences were, with the possible exception of, of psychology, which might not quite count as a, as a social science. So if we consider that group of disciplines, it's natural to ask, what is it that they have in common? What is it that makes them human sciences? Is there anything that we can say that they have in common, which is what uh, uh, is the basis of our description of this group of disciplines as human sciences? I would say the key word is behaviour. So they're trying to explain human behaviour, they're trying to explain the causes of human behaviour and sometimes also the consequences of human behaviour, but the ways in which they do this is, is very different. Right. And uh, it's interesting to ask uh, equally what the basis is of their being called sciences. Now, you've mentioned uh, explanation. No doubt that the aspiration to explain behaviour is part of what explains the fact that human sciences are called sciences. I think there's the element of looking for patterns, trying to find generalisations that hold, trying to find uh, laws that describe behaviour is an element in all of them, would you say? Yes, I think they're all trying to find patterns. Again, they do this in very different ways and even within something like economics you find very different ways of doing it. So sometimes you're looking for patterns in, individual be in the behaviour of individuals, sometimes you're looking for patterns in the behaviour of very large groups of people or even organisations. But certainly I think that the, the fact that they are referred to as sciences, it gives them a certain responsibility to be fairly methodical in how they approach things. And they do all have that in common. They mm. just use very different methods to do so. But they, they are all very... The, science in any of its guises always has to be a methodical endeavour. Another thing that we find in the natural sciences, uh, some more, some less, is prediction. Uh, saying what will happen. Not just knowing why things have happened, but knowing maybe what will happen. To what extent is prediction a feature of the different human sciences? Well, I think in something like economics, there are lots of fields, there are well, a few specific fields such as macroeconomics or finance where people are very interested in predictions. And that's partly because a lot of people have a lot of money and a lot of um, other interests vested in whether, for instance, there's going to be a financial crisis sure, or not. Yes. And there, another subject where there's a lot of interest in that is electoral politics. Again, the outcomes matter to people, and right. it matters that you might know ahead of time what is going to happen. Mm. Whereas for something like psychology, which is primarily concerned with looking at individuals and the behaviour of a, a particular individual, there's less scope for prediction there. Right. So, uh, yes. so I think they vary, but, uh, but certainly there's lots of demand for predictions. Sure, yes, yes. Uh, in as much as some of the human sciences are concerned with what to do with what's going to happen and with the future. The question that naturally arises, I think, whether the human scientist has a prescriptive role, mm -hmm. whether there's any sort of expertise, part of the human scientist's expertise, which concerns what ought to be done, what people should do. Uh, what, what do you feel about that? Well, I think the scientist certainly has a great responsibility, and especially when it comes to something that is going to have a big impact on a lot of people, something like an election or a crisis or, um, or something to do with the macroeconomy. And I think we as scientists would do well to remember that, that this is not just something that we study because we're interested in and we want to find out just in, in what way the, the, the building blocks fall in a sense, but we should be thinking about the fact that it's going to impact a lot of people who we've never met and we will never meet. 
And so when we make comments on what would be a good policy, for example, mm. we do need to think about the consequences. This, our, our subjects, in their most basic form, don't often require us to do that, but yeah. we should remember that anyway. Right. Uh, and I think there's a point that's of interest, particularly in connection with theory of knowledge, that uh, uh, explanations and predictions can be more or less secure. Uh, more or less uh, reliable and well-founded. And the, the pra practitioner of economics or, or political science is well advised to uh, bear these things in mind and make sure that the audience for their explanations and possibly predictions is aware of these things as well. Would that be fair to say? I think it would be fair to say, yes. There's always... Um in any science at all, there's always some margin of error. Mm. It's part of the methods, it's very simply inbuilt into the methods. Um, and for example, in economics typically, there's about a 5% chance of error. And for this reason, we need to be very careful when we cite any science as a fact. Right. Because we simply can never know, even the scientist who runs the numbers can do everything right, can do everything in in the completely accepted way and still come out with something that isn't completely certain, which is why science tends to repeat experiments and, sure. and economists do as well as do political scientists when mm. they experiment. Mm. And by repeating the experiments, we then get to a place where we can be quite sure that something is probably true because lots of people have found it at that very high level of probability. Right, right. So having talked about um, the similarities, what unites the different human sciences, let's see if we can say a word about how they differ, what distinguishes or individuates the different human sciences. Thinking of them as areas of knowledge might lead one to suppose that what distinguishes economics from politics, from anthropology, from sociology and so forth is that their questions are in separate areas. But I think that uh, we would be inclined to say that that's a misleading picture because often different human sciences have overlapping areas of interest. Would you agree with that? I would certainly agree with that. I think that to say, for example, that politics is only concerned with elections or anthropology is only concerned with remote civilizations or economics is only concerned with money, I think that would be hugely misleading. Mm. Many people think that, but, but it's, it, it's not true. Right. Um, if we look, for example, at something like the recent financial crisis, which started in about 2007, 2008, and whose effects we continue to feel to this day. The understanding that we have of that crisis is very much enhanced by looking at contributions from the different subjects. So perhaps from economics we can find out about what went wrong with the banks, what were the, uh, what were the financial structures that perhaps would be changing in order to avoid this in the future, or possibly how the crisis moved from the United States to the United Kingdom. Right. Politics might be able to tell us how elections had to do with that. So what, why, why politicians maybe took decisions that weren't so wise, well, that might have to do with the proximity of an election, and that would explain their behaviour. So they weren't being irrational if what they wanted to do was win the election. And then we could look at something like the phenomenon of herding from psychology, which answers the question of why one person makes a decision which is perhaps not the best decision, and then why lots of other people continue to make that same decision despite knowing that this is probably not a good decision. It's, and psychology would help us explain that. So I think there are contributions from all the different human sciences to explain the same phenomenon. Yes, yes. That, that's an interesting instance of uh, an apparent uh, collaboration between the different human sciences, all contributing somewhat to a fuller and more complete explanation of a large-scale phenomenon. I suppose, it's, in principle, uh, different human sciences could also be offering rival explanations of a, uh, of a phenomenon that they were severally interested in. Interested in. Uh, it probably varies from case to case, the extent to which sciences are collaborative or mutually competitive in, in, explaining, in explaining a phenomenon. In a way, it seems to me that uh, they, they differ partly in what sorts of causal factor they would like to cite as mainly determining what happens. And I suppose to that extent there's, there's room for, for rivalry, for, for competition in 
explanations given? I think there certainly is room, and um, and I think one of the one of the things that leads us to have these different causal explanations is that, of course, when you have a set of methods, you will measure things or you will study things that are appropriate for that set of methods. Mm -hmm. And in this way, for example, if we look at the question of, let's say, um, satisfaction with a, a current socio satisfaction with, with current political conditions or satisfaction with current economic conditions. So a political scientist is able to, to, to study things like whether people are satisfied with government, whether, um, whether people are satisfied with their own living conditions. An economist is far more likely to be required to produce things which involve quantitative study. Mm -hmm. And therefore they need to look at causes that are somehow measurable, which is how economists will tend to look at something like income or consumption. Um, or government spending or something like that, which is we have numbers for. And so it's mu much less likely that an economist will choose to look at something like happiness, simply because we haven't got the methods for yes. measuring that very reliably. Right. And so in that sense, the tools that we have at our disposal in each subject will influence what kinds of causes we're going to look at. Yes, so in thinking about the differences between the human sciences, it does look as if the simple picture by which they simply have different areas of expertise, different range of questions that they are interested in, won't do. There may be some differences of that kind, but there are lots of overlaps as well. And the identification and distinction between the human sciences is going to be more a complex matter of the types of question asked, the types of methods used, which may be more or less quantitative, and, perhaps depending on those methods, the types of causal factor that a given human science uh, is particularly keen to pick out and bring into prominence. So we've said something there about both similarities between and differences between quite a number of the human sciences. Mariana, thank you very much. Pleasure.